guess, I mean, the, um, and probably many of you have seen this film, I mean, and it's the first thing that I, I'd like to say is the absolute striking <coughs> genius of making a film in an elevator. Um, it's, you know, it was your first film, wasn't it, Mark? First, um, I had started filming another film before, but it never, it never got completed. Okay. It's a very long story, but it, it was an absolute disaster, <laughs> a, a human disaster. I, I, I'll just tell you briefly, I started filming a guy who I encountered um, in a newspaper story, actually, who was a little thing in the evening standard about this guy that had woken up on the streets with amnesia. And I was at the BBC, bored out of my mind, supposed to be, be developing ideas for a strand that I was working on <coughs> as a researcher, and I was very frustrated because all the ideas... It was a bit like a sort of, you know, factory, like people going through newspapers to find ideas. You'd present them to the commission and say, she'd, she'd usually say no. Uh, um, and, it, and I was quite depressed in that situation because it felt very sort of um, constrained in a way. Um, so I think one Friday afternoon I decided to, to you know, I'd, the kind of person, being the kind of person I am, I went home early and thought I'd walk around London, maybe I'd find an idea, you know, rather than looking in newspapers. But... Strangely enough, on the train, I read this little story in the newspaper about this guy who was, was suffering from amnesia. Um, and over that weekend, I, I got to meet him, and he was, at that point, in contact with the social services and the police, so it was quite tricky, but um, I went back to the BBC, took a camera out of the cupboard and started filming him. It's a very, very long, complicated story, but I stopped filming at some point after he'd gone back to Israel. Um, he'd regained his memory, lost it again, very confusing, but he murdered his children. Um, three, four weeks after I finished filming, and uh, the newspapers blamed the. Of course, it was the Murdoch press kind of tried to blame the BBC, and it was the headline saying BBC killed my babies. It was horrific. The whole thing was terrible. Wow. Um, so I still have at home a box of VHS um, duplicates of the rushes that were shot on tape with this. It's quite. It's a very fascinating, incredible story. Um, which I've never ever gone back to. I've just yeah. left it in this box. I've never quite thrown away the rushes either. It's kind of. Um, I, I did try to sort of think about it as a film later on, and um, I was about to get commissioned, and someone hired, and the commission at the BBC stopped it. Yeah. They got nervous again. Probably rightly so, though, in a way. So that was my first film, you know, filming experience. <laughs> it was quite a shock. Um, but, you know, in a way, looking back, it was sort of. I learned a hell of a lot about. Because when you're behind the camera, you are in this very sort of strange position of, you know, you're filming reality. It's it's people and often complicated lives, and um, you can enter into a slight fantasy world. And sometimes things come back to smack you around the face. And it wasn't, you know, it was a terrible thing that happened, of course. But in terms of, you know, looking back on it now, it actually has helped a lot mm. in dealing with people. And, you know, and you have sort of innocently demonstrated one of the things that I was talking about in terms of the contingency of things. You know, that documentary cinema is very heavily yeah. predicated upon uh, the chance, you know, the chance encounter and the reality as well. And there is a, a, an actual reality that impinges on the film. And you've, you've just mentioned something quite extraordinary, if you wish, but something that then you know, s precludes, you know, even com continuing with the project or... Yeah, the chance thing is interesting because, I mean, I the great joy of making these kind of films for me is that they're all sort of based on chance to a certain yeah. extent. That it's it's very you know, I was listening to your talk. I was thinking, well, this is how I should pitch my films to commissioner. You know, it's about this. You know, I mean, if I, if I knew all the things that you s spoke about before, I'd, I could never even start. It'd be too intimidating. But there's you know the I start with very I, some themes basically in a place usually. Um, and you know the, the kind of chance encounters are what really excite me and then and then it sort of becomes about um, trying to make something more than just what is seemingly in front of you um, because often the reality is, is unsatisfying to me it's not enough yeah. um, so for example I don't know um, in the clip we've just watched a lot of those moments are quite sort of, you know, fly on the wall, if you like. In that, I think in all those moments there wasn't, there was nothing, there were no tricks behind those those the incidents. Although, you know, I had to adopt a certain role. I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I purposely don't say anything to break the break the silence and the awkwardness. I mean, you can feel the tension when the, 
the couple get in and you know they're just looking at each other and uh, you know I, I suppose I learned in that moment to just you know my instinct was to sort of break break that tension that awkwardness and you know and crack a joke or something but much better just to shut up and let it be you know and then something interesting happened um, but when the guy for example talks about the sauna and jacuzzi I'd already before that before that scene was shot <coughs> that moment was shot I'd been to his apartment and seen that he had this sauna and jacuzzi and I wanted to at that by that point I understood that I was making a film in a lift because actually when I had the idea I didn't know that I would just stay in the lift it came about in the filming process yeah. itself so knowing that he had this sauna and jacuzzi I thought that was quite interesting and you know when we cut to him it's silent and then he just starts talking but before that there would have been some preparation so can you tell me about the sauna and jacuzzi in your flat <laughs> or tell us that as if as if you're just telling it to me for the first time. Yeah. Um, it's moments like that where you start to intervene and then change the reality that are becoming more and more interesting to me, actually, mm -hmm. because I think that, you know, so much, I mean, everything's filmed now, and the challenge is to, to, to film it in a way that then feels more interesting than everything else that's being filmed, you know? I mean, yeah. it, it's just to kind of make it something more than what it is, and yeah. you, I mean, you touch upon that quite a lot in Men of the City, and, where I go quite far in yeah. the, in the um, stylization, you could say. Absolutely. Film, yeah. By the way, I mean, here even you do sense that kind of construction of story as well, you know, like in the sense that even in post-production, you clearly pace the story, you know, you start by showing, you know, characters who are very yeah. um, uh, you know, shy and then, you know, progressively they open up. You know, yeah, so I, tried to, I tried to sort of, I mean, Especially in that film, I learned a lot about um, how to progress a film because I don't usually follow, you know, very dramatic stories. That I mean, sometimes people pass away in the films and it's dramatic, but actually, it's not. It's it's not a dramatic presented as a dramatic event yeah. in, in the film as such. And I don't look for stories that are very yeah. sensational or that are going to have twists and turns at every corner, and, and that's what's just driving the, the you know the whole film. <coughs> um, but there's a sense of, you know, at the beginning, we meet the person and they're, you, know, you start to kind of build up an idea of who they are. And then by the end of the film, there's somebody very different and you've kind of gone on a, a journey into them as a, as a yeah. person. I mean, it's what you're talking about, portrait. And that for me is the sort of narrative. So <coughs> the decision to, you know, by starting with people's reticence and the awkwardness, it gives me somewhere to go, you know. If, if the first scene is somebody confessing, you know, like the guy who lost his parents and much later yeah. in the film. I mean, it wouldn't work in that way. So it's about sort of, you know, stepping into a situation and then sort of unfolding the story slowly. Mm -hmm. Which, you know, I, it's something I've learned through sitting with editors. Um, and, you know, just... The editor that I usually work with always describes it as if you're you know, going out for a meal and you get served. You know, you sit down, you get a menu, you know, you have time to decide what you want, and then you get your first course, second course, and so on, and and that's the exp you know that's sort of the experience that slowly, slowly by the end the end of it you're you can't you're totally full and can't move, or, or you're satisfied in some way. <laughs> uh, listen, just in or in the very very first um, uh, sequence, you already you know it's noti noticeable how you use sound uh, in particularly expressive manner in this film. Um, and that is something that you know one can find in other films as well. So, are you very aware of that component of things, and do you think about it afterwards? Or it's different. I must say, it's different in different films. I mean, in the lift, I, it, I from being there and being in that situation, which is it's quite you know it's quite strange. I mean, I learned. Yeah. I sort of made the film as I was in the situation. Yeah. So, I wanted. A, I wanted to. I mean, first of all, I. This, I, I discovered the sort of you know the, the lift shaft itself because the lift had broken down one day, and I you know I turned up to film and it, it wasn't working. There were engineers there, and I looked up and thought, wow, that's really interesting. <laughs> Didn't even think about it before, you know. Actually, you see the sort of guts of the building, you know, and of course it's very mechanical and a nice counterpoint to the people. Yeah. Um, so I immediately um, called up the production manager and asked her to take out some insurance so I could jump on top of the lift and ride up and down. I literally got those shots in, in that moment and then started to think more about the sound because you would hear um, I was always conscious of course this is a film about people living side by side yeah. and on top of each other and you would always hear strange sounds circulating around the building and it was 
it also the tower blocks they move slightly as well, and you can and the wind sort of howls around it. It's very it's a very strange space. I wanted to capture some of that. So for one day, I hired a sound recorder and we went around yeah. recording sounds, sometimes creating sounds. <coughs> I remember buying a, a an old audio cassette of some Bangladeshi music, putting it in an old tape recorder at the bottom of the lift shaft and recording it from the top, just so it felt like the sound was coming from someone's flat. Or something. Uh, and then picking up bits and pieces along the way, yeah. but only over one day, and then we used that those sounds as a you know, as starting point. Yeah. And uh, I mean, we can talk about some of the things also as we watch other clips. But I guess one question is also, um, you know, you you seem to stand out for a certain ability to get people to talk to you to open up. You know, like this is only the beginning of the film, but people who have seen the film will know that by you know the mid of the film you have had some uh, quite extraordinary revelations you know from uh, from the subjects and is that something you you know you look for um, does it just happen yeah i mean I'm, it's very simple i mean i'm interested in people rather than ideas yeah. so unless you know there's something really interesting or fascinating for me to explore with a person then it's it's dead <laughs> yeah. um, so the rest of the film really is sort of, I mean, you know, the other elements of course are really important, but, but without, without those people and, and getting to a certain point with those people, then for me there's sort of nothing there. Yeah. Um, I'm always fasc fascinated by filmmakers, you know, like for example in, I don't know, Sansalil and Chris Marker, you know, where there are, there are no characters, you know, but it's so emotional and kind of engaging in a similar way, you know, I, I think that <coughs> we all have different, you know, for most have different ways of, of, of getting to that. But for me, it's with the people, for sure. How long were you in the elevator for? Um, about two months. Two months. Yeah. How physical is that? I mean, how, you know, is there a physical impact? You know, I, I, I thought of uh, Werner Herzog famous, famously said that things come from your knees and thighs, you know, rather than <laughs> from your brain. I mean, how much... <laughs> of the physical is there and I was thinking also of that sequence that I mentioned in my talk about that woman who kind of at some point challenges you quite aggressively you know she says what what what's the purpose of this why are you still here so uh, can you say something about this kind of you know your it was a mixture because I had sometimes I had you know felt like hours of sitting down in there resting because no, nothing was happening yeah. I mean what you know I'd be in the lift and the door would be shut and then suddenly I get called up to the floor. It's quite exciting because I didn't know where I was going. Uh, especially in the beginning because I didn't know who lived on floor seven. And after a while I thought, okay, it's yeah. floor seven, it's going to be, you know, Lily or whoever. I think she was 13. But, um, so there was an excitement there. And you know, the physicality from, it comes in the moment of filming because, um, I mean, that camera I was using was quite light, actually. Yeah. It wasn't that difficult to hold. The <coughs> film I'm making at the moment with that camera there. That exact camera. Um, <laughs> it's quite heavy, and you, when you're filming a moment, and you know that you don't want to cut because, you know, or you don't want the camera to move or destroy the shot, then it, it's a real, you know, yeah. you, it, it gives a sort of impetus to everything because you've got to get it at that point. And it does. It is a very physical activity. Um, it, yeah, I mean, it's it's quite it's quite difficult. Mm -hmm. There's another aspect of it which is sort of, you know, the. It's often a test of endurance because um, with a lot of the films I'm wandering around in this space looking for people and that takes a lot of time and the researchers that I've worked with and there have been many they some of them you know have breakdowns after three weeks <laughs> don't worry we're on a short film together you'll be fine for this one in a few days <laughs> um, others have lasted for a year you know I mean Georgina worked on the road for over a year yeah. literally kind of wandering up and down that road looking for people and I mean you know I don't it's not like she's out every single day and Lots of times spent eating and having coffee or whatever, but <laughs> but there's a sort of, you know that's quite a test, quite you know, because you're. Yeah. It's difficult to find, you know. It's, I mean, you, you, you know, when you find somebody, you know, you know, you, you know, they're interesting, but mm. to, to get to that point, it's, it's a lot of you know, uncovering different stones and searching. Shall we maybe watch the next yeah. one? Um, Can I ask you a quick question? Yes. Sure. Sure. 
Was there at some point, I mean, having grown up on an estate like that, and uh, did you ever sort of encounter some uns unsavory characters? Like, were you ever afraid at certain point? I was never afraid. Like you were on your, your the, own I was with a researcher, but they were uh, they were outside. Yeah, Andrew was outside the living. Oh, right, right. No, there was some. There was a one really hairy moment, but it was. Actually, there were two. One time when the doors opened, there were like seven or eight young Bengali kids. Mm. Um, and we were sort of, there was a bit of a standoff, but, and they all got in the lift, and, and they were sweet as anything once they got in. It was just that little initial moment of like, are they going to mug me? And, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was, that, but it died very quick. The most scary one was that I was standing there, the camera looks like a gun when the mic's, you know, mm, when the yeah. mic's on top, and the door opened, and this woman just started screaming. She thought I was standing there with a gun, wow. which is really interesting <laughs> because, I mean, it could yeah. happen, couldn't it? You yeah. know? And um, so she started screaming, I started screaming, and <laughs> it was just this, this moment of pure horror, you know? Um, so, it, you know, it was just, it was crazy. Most, if people didn't want to be filmed, then they, were usually, they would make it very clear. Yeah, that was the other thing I was going to ask about, um, you know, the, obviously you may film these people who signed something to say that it's all right. Yeah. It was strange. There was a strange. There was a guy there, who'd re a very middle class guy, who recently split with his wife, who had rented a flat there as part of the separation. And he was curiously, like, really interested in us in the film, but never wanted to be filmed. So he'd want to come in and talk, but not, not when the camera was on, which was a bit strange. And then there was a there was an English an English guy with a bicycle who would only talk to us with his back turned to us. <laughs> The flat cap of his bicycle, he'd only ever sort of engaged, but he was looking away. Um, I did try and get it into the film, but it, was, it didn't, didn't quite work. And um, yeah, there was an old Polish guy who was, you well, know, was ranting point. about, you know, the big brother in Poland and why, you know, why you've, you know, the camera's everywhere and there was no escape. Right, I know it's just a little bit you, you filmed us there, there was um, the drunk guy right towards the yeah, end. Uh, yeah. Most of the time you're in the lift and, and at that point yeah. you've been ejected from the lift. Yes. Yeah. Because you're filming into the yeah. lift as the door closes. Yeah. The so there's a certain sensitivity you have to have to what's going on, I suppose. Right? Yeah, he was very drunk and angry and sort of, yeah, you know, just right. ranting because he was drunk. And then, <laughs> but, you know, but we, he comes back two or three times. There's a lovely moment where he talks about. I asked him about a memory from his childhood and he talks about seeing a golden eagle in Scotland and that it just comes out and it's beautiful and then he's, he cuts it short and says, I've got to go and get thanks and he wanders off. And it's just, you know, it's like little moments like that. So he, so he develops as, you know, it was interesting because then I thought, okay, he's, he's been quite aggressive and angry. How can I make a little mini narrative out of that? Mm -hmm. So make sure I'm there next time he comes back so I can talk to him about that. And he came back and he was sober and he didn't remember. He said, who me? You know? <laughs> Um, next, yeah, with the next clip, uh, maybe we'll just very briefly contextualize yeah. it. I mean, this is from Calais, uh, and uh, he's one of the main characters in Calais. Um, and I don't know if you want to say anything about him um, for people who haven't seen the film, especially. Um, yeah, he's, he's, he was from Afghanistan. I mean, there are different characters in the film, and we've sort of seen some of them in the talk. Um, he was one of a few hundred people that um, were... I, I arrived in Kelly just as the official Red Cross camp had shut. Which was, when I was doing the research, the camp was open, and I never wanted to make a film directly about the refugee situation. For me, when I first went there, what was interesting was this transient town, this place where all, all kinds of people were stuck, not just refugees living in the camp. I felt, even, you know, even then, it was 2002, but I first went out there, that... Uh, the sort of refugee story, in a way, was too familiar to sort of. It, it, it just felt like I'd be treading on, treading over sort of uh, ground that was, you know, pretty much well trodden. Um, so I went there to, or, or when I was there, I mean that that was a very sort of dominant thing in the town. But I started by spending more time there. I started to sort of build up a picture of this place that, you know, where the, the whole town became a bit like a camp. Um, Fences everywhere. People stuck. People, you know, in transition, wanting to kind of be somewhere else. Um, so, so a kind of broader picture emerged. But Ejaz was one of the one of those people that were left on the streets after the camp closed. And yeah, I mean, he was somebody that jumped out from the crowd. Basically, there were mainly men at that time, less women and children than there are now. Um, and there was something about him that I just kind of immediately connected with. So I, 
he was when we got the money together, he was the first person that I filmed, and I filmed him for three weeks, and then he disappeared, and I hadn't filmed any other characters at that point, so he he set the sort of benchmark really. He was the first, you know, in the film, he, he you know he's he's in the film the whole way through, uh, but I had his story of that because he he disappeared at some point, um, and then I had to sort of build everything else around. You know, he was very much in my in my mind because I filmed his whole story, and then. Yeah it informed who else I was looking for, if you like, quite strongly. And I guess before, just before we, we show this clip, I mean, for, if you have not seen the film, this scene is quite shocking when it comes in because um, Ijaz is a very um, optimistic character. I mean, in spite of the extraordinarily uh, terrible human experience he's been through, uh, he, he has that kind of lightness um, that um, I, I mentioned in my talk. So when you catch him, you know, in, in this moment of, um, of pain and uh, unrestrained pain is, is, is a shock for the spectator as well. So yeah, I'll just, just say something about that because, yeah. um, you know, every day he could go to certain places in, the, in Cali where they would... There were, there were times where the police wouldn't arrest them when they were having lunch and yeah. when the various charities were there giving out food. So we turned up at one of those moments in the car. It was it was raining and I could see that he walked off behind this behind this sort of white building here and I just grabbed the camera from the car and went around there and this is how this scene emerged. Yeah. Um, I was working with a researcher and sometimes we were booming with the sound but he he was quite a slow person and yeah. <laughs> by the time he got all the sound record, the, the extra sound stuff out, I'd already shot this scene. <laughs> um, so it's just an example of, you know, sometimes you plan a lot for some spontaneity, you try and arrange things and then let it happen and sometimes you turn up and something's happening and you have to react to it. Um, it was very difficult but yeah. can watch it and talk about that after. Because I cannot wear more difficulties, I cannot find more difficulties. This is, I think this is enough. I cannot more. You feel like claiming asylum in France? No. Even now. Still want to get to England. Try again tonight. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, that, you know, that was <laughs> that wasn't scripted. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess uh, you know it makes us laugh, but at the same time, it's probably deeply revealing of how he was yeah. living in the streets in yeah, French Paris. people for him were Where, people from Calais. Yeah, yeah. yeah and the police, the police and, you yeah. know, uh, so um, but also I think it does hint also if you want at, at the sense of um, you know, how we are trapped by a particular dream, you know, which is 
being, which has formed in our mind. I mean, so many people want to come to London, for so many people want to come to England. Um, and, you know, uh, it's, it's quite interesting how in your film that there's English people who <laughs> want to go away yeah. from England, you know, yeah. so there is this, uh, um, I guess the big theme here maybe to discuss is the ethical issue, uh, which is, um, you know, how you handle that kind of, you know, border between your need for, uh, to make a film and to have an event, to capture an event, to capture a story, you know, like uh, event in the sense of the moment, you know, the moment in which something is revealed. Um, and, you know, the ethics of, you know, being there when somebody breaks down and, and capturing that on film. So how do you feel about that very delicate, you know, border? And, I mean, here it makes for one of the most powerful yeah. scenes of the film. And it's a moment of truth, you know, in which you know this man who has been, you know, sort of in spite of the incredible life, you, you know, and experiences has had, you know, he's always been, and, and here's where you really touch, I think, with your hand, you know, the the, the death of his tragedy, if you wish, you know. But at the same time, you know, there, there there is a moment of, you know, what do I do? I mean, do I film him while he's crying, he's breaking down, or what? Yeah, um, it's it's always a difficult question. I mean. I think because I, you have to be quite ruthless, if I'm really honest, in the sense that, you know, when I was sat in that car seeing him running off, my first instinct was to go run after him because because mm. something I felt happens. something interesting was going to happen. So, and I'm making a film and, um, and I want to film it. Um, at the same time, you know, and, you know I'm, when I'm looking through the viewfinder filming this scene, um, I'm thinking very much about the framing, you know, yes. how long to hold the shot for. Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about what he's saying, what's going on with him. <coughs> um, and when I feel like it's, it's finally run out of steam yeah. as a scene, <laughs> as a film moment, then I, I'll cut the camera and then another reality kind of unfolds. Mm -hmm. um, I remember saying to him, you know, you must come and just stay in the hotel. It was really odd because, you know, there we were. We had a hotel room to go back to. And I said, come on, come back, stay in the hotel. Or just come back and get dry, warm, whatever. And, and he refused all of that, you know. He was so sort of, in a way, dignified. You know, it's, you know I tried to give him some money to help yeah. him out. He wouldn't take any money. Mm -hmm. I remember hiding some in his pocket. Um, you know, um, it's, it's, it's very tricky, but... Um, you know, if you don't do it, you don't, you don't have a film. So it's kind of um, a dilemma. Yeah. Um, and I suppose after that first experience, it's also why I wanted to mention it, because I think it shaped a lot of what yeah. I, yeah. Or, you know, it, it informed my, you know, way of making films quite a lot after, is that I was, I, mean, I think I <coughs> was really naive when I was filming this um, guy with amnesia. I don't think I'd done anything wrong, but I just looking back, I think that, I was shocked in a way because I had no, no idea that this guy that I was filming, who I knew for some months, would would turn out to do such a terrible thing. I, I just didn't see it in him, you know. Yeah. Um, so when it when it comes to sort of dealing with people that are vulnerable or or, or reality, it's there's we were in a sort of kind of schizophrenic position, um, and I never I never put myself now in a situation where I make the people feel like I'm there to help them. Yeah. You know, I, my relationship was very much about the film yeah. and, you know, I would never promise them things that I can't, can't do. I mean, you know, I can't be somebody's social worker and make a film at the same time. And if, I mean, it helps working with the researcher because they, they then can also take some of the kind of, uh, or you can, sh you can share that. Yeah. Um, and I suppose now I don't film with anybody that I feel is too vulnerable to be filmed. That's, 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 um, quite and, and sometimes, I mean, these things just happen. Like in this particular case, for instance, you said I, ch I chased him because I saw him going yeah. away and I thought something is going to happen. Yeah. But I'm thinking of another moment in the film when there is the couple um, who, as all of a sudden, they reveal that they have been entertaining <coughs> the thoughts of possibly committing suicide. Um, and 
I don't know whether that, I mean, is that something you found yourself to deal with in that moment? I was, uh, was I, it the revelation? Yeah, just because some of you might not have seen the scene, it's a moment where I'm filming, you saw a picture of a, a couple sat in their home, their slightly ostentatious home. Um, that's actually probably from that moment. Um, yeah. They're in a really bad way financially, and she was a refugee in the Second World War, and we're talking about that. And halfway through this filmed moment, she she she, she reveals that they've con she's contemplated ending it all. And I, re I was genuinely shocked. The camera yeah. slightly shakes, and yeah, I it, it, it's that. genuine, yeah. totally genuine. Yeah. Um, I mean, having made so many films since, maybe I would, you know, it, it's hard. I mean, there's a lot in, in the Calais film that is very, very kind of spontaneous, genuine reactions. And sometimes you find yourself saying things, and it's not genuine because you're trying to repeat moments or something. Um, and it was a horrible situation. I mean, I continued filming, and we spoke about it, and I was there uh, for probably 20 minutes or something. But they had they had cats, and I'm allergic to cats, so as soon as I finished shooting that scene, I had to leave the apartment, which was terrible. Um, I said, look, I need to go outside for half an hour and just get rid of the... I was sneezing, and my eyes were watering. I couldn't breathe, and there she was talking about suicide. It was really awful. So I was sat outside, and then... When I got my breath back, was able to kind of when I was composed. I, f I uh, knocked on the door, and there was no answer. And all I could hear was the parrot squeaking and squalling, and it was just—it was horrific. It was really an awful situation. I thought, no. <coughs> anyway, two hours later, I managed to get her on the phone, and she she said, oh, "I've been out eating ice cream with my husband to cheer myself up." And it was a big relief. Um, you know, it's one of those—it's one of those moments where, she, you know. She really mean it, or is she being melodramatic? You know what what's going on. You know, but the fact that she sort of says it, and um, I was, at, you know, very genuinely sh shocked. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, you know, it's it was interesting when I showed her the film because she she watched the film and she was very moved by her own story, and mm -hmm. she didn't mention that at all as being a problem in terms of it being in the film. So it was clear I wanted her to to so watch it. I, I mean, before showing, I said to her, "There's, I don't know if you remember, but when we filmed this moment, you, you talk about some, you speak about some very difficult things, and um, but the only thing she was really concerned was whether the bank would f would find out yeah. about her financial situation and not lend her any more money." So I changed a few words around to help that a bit. But you know, she was she was happy for that for that scene to be shown, and, okay. and we still have, I still have contact with her. She's one of probably you know. One of the few people that I, I mean, I do maintain contact, but then it sort of diminishes over over time. But yeah. with her, we speak probably two or three times a year. I occasionally see her when I'm passing through Kelly. Mm -hmm. um, her husband passed away some six, seven years ago now, so okay. she's on her own. But. Yeah, that was a question that I have for you in the sense that, you know, the, the stories that you tell you will become so intense, also for the spectator that one, you know, does wonder, you know, like how much, you know, you end up being invested in these people, you know, but you also said earlier quite Yeah, it was quite, it was quite difficult with Tulia because mm -hmm. she, she talks about this in the film, she never had children. Yeah. Um, and she, she started to see me as, a bit, you know, a bit like the son she never had, and <laughs> <laughs> that comes with certain obligations. Yeah, no, it must be. Um, <laughs> 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 I think, um, yeah, I went to I think I, yeah I went to Kelly once with the kids and we saw her. I mean, she's I, Belgian Television wanted to do an update and I went back with them. So I spent mm -hmm. I have spent quite a bit of time with her since yeah. since that film and we speak quite regularly. But um, again, it's I I manage it because you know I can't I can't you know I don't have the ability or to, to I can be there in a certain way, but I'm not you know it's it's, it's difficult. You know, I don't yeah. I don't want to become sort of too close in a way. Yeah. And I guess, I mean, why don't we watch the next uh, clip maybe and, and then we, we connect the two of them because uh, they're from the same film. So the next time you chose um, is a beautiful clip. Um, also from Canada. You think I could get a wife in Lithuania? I could go there, get a nice girl to marry and take her back home to Jamaica. You know, look out for a real good. Take her back to Jamaica in the sunshine. 
think I think I could find a little wedding. What about you? What's your dream? My dream? Yeah. My dream. Come back home. To go back home to Lithuania. Okay, okay, okay. All right, man. Don't worry, man. Right? Yeah. I give you my address, right? And you write me in Jamaica. <laughs> right? And I send it for you. I'm serious, man. You do it? that is very evident, I think, in this scene is the way in which it is constructed as a scene. Um, so there is a little narrative inside, you know, and then you rely a lot on music, um, and there's uh, pauses, you know, there's the moment of the birds, etc. So I don't know if you want to say something about that, and how you construct. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of, that was quite chaotic, I mean, the, well, let's go back to the beginning. I, I met Paul, I mean, no, let's go back to the, to the, to the beginning. I was got interested in that space actually, yeah. so I used to go to that space. It's where just before the the traffic would go through to the tunnel, and sometimes people would get kicked off the bus there, and they were in this kind of no man's land. It was sort of an interesting space to to be. And myself and the researcher used to go back there every so often and spend a few hours to see who turned up. And it, I went there a few times and never found the right character. You know, somebody that I really felt was. Surprising, it's going to be interesting with a with this lightness as well, because there are a lot of heavy Polish, Lithuanian men builders, you know, who are you know they were in the similar situation, but the, as a, as a character for a film, they didn't seem right. I wasn't so drawn to to the ones that I met, and then Paul turned up. So this thing of chance, you know, he just turned up there, and um, I probably spoke to him a bit about what happened, and then filmed. A first scene 
um, and I thought, well, he what he was. So once he was kicked off the bus, there in reality, he he was then going to get another bus to try and make his way back home. Um, now that wasn't very good for the film because I wouldn't have had enough time with him to build us the story. So I I said to him, if I if I provide a hotel for you, will you stay there all day um, till nightfall and make your journey tomorrow? Um, <coughs> and then during that that day, uh, Ernesto turned up. Um, so there's a huge amount of intervention, and I, you know, I feel free to do that because the what I was trying to express in that scene, the sort of truth of the situation as I saw it, you know, about being dumped on this no man's land, yeah. is all that mattered, and whether he could have got a bus out three hours later or five hours later was just a sort of factual thing that I didn't really yeah. care about. I was trying to kind of, you know, represent something of that situation um, from a filmic point of view. So the first big intervention was sort of asking him to, to hang around um, when he didn't actually have to. And then uh, Ernesto turned up at some point and he, Paul was on a radio mic and I noticed he was talking to her um, and I quickly got into a, a, into a position to film it. And I think at the beginning, you kind of notice that she's sort of, she sort of knows she's being filmed, but she's not quite sure what's going on. So at some point, I had to cut and go and explain to her what we were doing. Um, and that's quite difficult, because I had no, I didn't want to destroy something that was happening there and um, to sort of let it unfold. Um, so we kept filming. Um, I did have time. I remember, I think she went to buy some cigarettes from the petrol station and I went with her and we spoke a bit about the film. I actually gave her 40 euros because she didn't have enough money for the bus fare. Um, so the 40 euros she talks about is the 40 euros that I've given her. Um, wasn't enough. Of course, because if I gave her the, the problem, there'd be no drama there. No, I didn't, I didn't, oh, no. I, I didn't actually know about the price of the bus ticket. But I, just, I just gave her 40 euros. Um, and that would have been very evil. That would have been, that would have been evil. <laughs> um, and she, you know, and, she, and then I f we filmed a bit more. And I, I then encouraged Paul to talk to her more. Um, so again, it's something that was, that was happening in reality. If I would have just grabbed it as it was, it would have been very messy, probably unusable, and wouldn't have, wouldn't have become the scene. So it's about that, you know, it's literally getting an idea in reality that something's happening and trying to you know, to, to intervene, to shape it in a way that, that allows it to become something. Yeah. And, you know, in that space, um, it was always quite striking that at sunset the birds would kind of just fly across borders in a way that humans can't, and, yeah. you know, so to, to film that. And you can see we're struggling to get Paul, the Jamaican guy, into the scene, you know, because I only filmed one or two, you know, it's, as a sort of, you know, a sort of level of narrative and structure, it's, Paul's story and Ernesta comes into it. I mean, she yeah. kind of takes over because she's yeah. such a powerful yeah. character, but you can see we're struggling with the one or two shots we have to keep Paul in the scene so we see it through his eyes and then he's left there at the end, you know. Um, and uh, again, that's something about the nature of the documentary is that, you know, when I was shooting this scene, I had no idea how it would cut, you know, how it would, how it would work out, how, you know, how to actually construct that scene and when it would come in the film, for example. So it's all... Um, it's it's when you're shooting you 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 know you're you're having to sort of preempt things as much as possible but you really do not know how it will find its way into the film and that happens a lot there's another example in the road where the old Jewish lady um, falls over and I filmed her falling over and obviously cut the camera when she hits the floor and again it's a moment that I sort of forgot about when the editor saw it in the context of the whole film which becomes very much about fate and people's journeys. It suddenly became an interesting moment. Um, so you never quite know when you're, when you're filming what something will become and how it will fit into the, the narrative of the film. So was the biblical thing, let's say, in, uh, in Man of the Cities, is it something that was born after you shot, or is it something that guided the shooting? We had an edit longer? period of a few weeks and then had a break. Yeah. And in that few weeks, I think it's the, you know, there was the, the actual real material was okay, you know, but it wasn't doing enough. Um, and it was quite a weird film because I started before the economic crisis happened, so there was no, the idea came from the BBC, they were just interested in doing something in the city, they didn't, it wasn't yeah. prescribed at all, that was what started the sort of, the, the research for the film, um, and 
during the filming, the economic crisis happened, which was quite confusing because whilst I was filming with a hedge fund manager and filming him on the day that Lehman Brothers bank collapsed and was losing millions of pounds, I was sort of there filming it. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to make a current affairs film about the economic crisis. So on the one hand, it was great. On the other hand, it was, it was, a, it was a bit of a curse because I, I was suddenly tied to this event. And we tried to free ourselves of that in the, in the edit. And I think part of the way we've done that was to then, you know, to, to pull out the sort of metaphors that were there, um, you know, in the rushes, but then to, to take, to stylize them basically mm -hmm. through music. And I do remember going out specifically when I knew it was going to rain and the film will rain and yeah. all of that. We could watch a clip from that film maybe could and do, talk yeah. a bit more Change about around, that. Yeah. Um, supposed to be doing here? Why did I choose to come to Earth? If this planetary life is like a sabbatical in the universal cosmology of things, I'm wondering whether cleaning has something to do with that, or whether I'm just supposed to be here to... Uh... just observe how things are. Going through your mind right now as you're standing here. I'm standing here. Yeah. Well, uh, the fact that I saved some of my life for you uh, two years ago, I was having a cigarette. What happened? I just got a woman came down, drowned, and I swung out under the bridge and got up, pulled her back, got these steps down in. And I have to, you know, I think when I'm out here having a cigarette, I think, oh, you know. I wonder if I ever have to do it again. How did the woman come to be drowning? I have no idea. No idea. I got her to the steps and the police and ambulance took her away. You feel her filth? No. Never know nothing. That's over for two years now. Um, that illustrates it quite well because so S Steve the street sweeper was somebody I was interested in because he is this character that wanders around this space and is observing and it's sort of what I'm doing in the film it's I quite like that that comparison between you know the two of us um, and I was filming that little moment with him and then I noticed this guy standing there and I literally just went up to him and asked him if I could film and ask him a question I had no idea that this story would come. It could have been completely useless and it would never have worked and he said nothing interesting. And then he, he told this story. So it's another example of yeah. chance and then how, again, not knowing how we would weave that into the narrative and 
um, and it becomes significant in the context of a film that's sort of, you know, this sort of social Darwinism, and suddenly you find this act of kindness and generosity and, um, you know, in the context of the, 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 the story that we're telling becomes interesting. But also the, the, the theme of drowning is at the Absolutely, same time. Absolutely, yeah. 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 And then, you know, David, the editor, deciding to, to, to cut it in that way and to... Yeah. So it's sort of making these little moments of reality more than what they are. Yes, um, yeah. Which, um, you know, you diff I mean, I, you know, I, I do that to different extents, a different extent in different films, depending on the need of the film. But it's not something you're always aware of, I'm always aware of in the beginning. It's, yeah. It emerges. And, I mean, a big question is, how did you meet Steve? Because, I mean, where did you find him? I mean, he's an extraordinary character. Yeah, I mean, just, <laughs> we spoke to a lot of people, you know, we met, I like the idea of the sort of, I mean, you know, I was speaking to managing directors of banks and, yeah. you know, and everybody in between, so that was sort of the idea in the beginning. Well, it wasn't, you know, in the beginning, I, there, there was no sort of, uh, I felt uncomfortable about, when, when, the, when the BBC mentioned the idea of making a film in the city, I felt immediately uncomfortable, so I felt that, what would I have in common with these, the, with the city workers, um, you know, the bankers, etc. how would I relate to them? Um, and you know, then I started to look for all kinds of people, um, and I, I just thought about the levels and the, you know, the different jobs people do in that space. Yeah. I spent a lot of time with office cleaners as well. Yeah. Um, sort of army of South Americans that travel in at five in the morning, four in the morning, yeah. and clean, yeah. cleaning the traders' computers. And, yeah. And uh, I noticed that there's uh, some um, uh, iconographical correspondence. I mean. You, for instance, sometimes you focus on uh, the consumption of sandwiches. Um, you know, it's something that uh, happens, and they do it at all levels, which I thought was kind of interesting. You know, like there's, uh, uh, you know, the stockbroker is outside for a moment and eats a sandwich. You know, but and the same happens with the street cleaner, or you know, so yeah. there's there's ways in which you know things kind of all reconnect. Yeah, I mean, I think that what we tried to do in the film was also. So look, you know, these, of course, these men come from sort of wildly different places, but actually they're facing similar struggles. Yeah. You know, so it, so it creates a sort of cons consistency and coherency in the film, yeah. and also why it's about men. You know, yeah. I did research with some women, um, and I, none of them became, you know, people. Well, none of them became characters. Didn't stick with any, um, yeah. and it it was it. You know. <laughs> People often ask, well, how do you, you know, how do you decide on characters, etc.? And you know, it's never a demographic exercise for me, or, tick, or, or ticking boxes. And it just felt that for me, the the way to tell this story and, and you know what it was suggesting that the men were the kind of yeah. people to focus on. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. I mean, yeah. I, I think I, uh, there was an article I saved it, but I didn't have time to read it. I saw it yesterday uh, about uh, how much uh, the market would be less volatile if more women worked in the stock exchange. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. So that there is some evidence that points to the evidence, fact that they yeah. would actually. <laughs> yeah. uh, so and I thought of your film, you know, because it is a, a film about men, you know, in the sense, you know, it is very much about men. Yeah, on the trading floor that I filmed, that it was such a charged, you know, sort of masculine environment that yeah. there were a couple of women working there, yeah. and you see in the scene, and um, they're, they're sort of deployed in a particular way to, yeah. to highlight that. Yeah, that scene, I mean, we had a brief chat about that, and then in the end I didn't really have time to make the clip, but that particular scene in the Stock Exchange made me think very, very strongly of uh, um, Michelangelo Antonioni's uh, scene of the Stock Exchange in um, Eclipse, uh, which again is kind of testosterone-driven, you know, and, and, and again I think the metaphor of the jungle is is unavoidable, you know, because there is this... this uh, um, this, this kind of big competition and, uh, and yeah. but, um, but, but the character of Steve, you know, this sort of uh, philosopher, you know, it's, it's quite an extraordinary character that really balances things out in, a, in an incredible way. There is a lot of work in this film on editing and uh, more so than in other films. Do you do that yourself with the editor or...? No, I mean, because we've worked, we've worked together many times before, so what happens now is that, I mean, Men in the City was shot on tape, so with all the films we would, you know, we would traditionally sort of sit down and, you know, watch the rushes being put into the system, because you have to do that in real time, and discuss the film. I would go away, he would cut some scenes, I would come back and see them. I mean, the trading scene that you speak about, 
you know, I came back and, and then one day there was this soundscape of animal noises on it, and I had no, you know, David just done it, and it was great because I could then see these rushes that were, you know, what I'd filmed were these moments of when, when the, at the end of the day they have this frantic trading, and it only happens for 10, 15 minutes every day. And that's what I'd filled but over five days. I had to go there at a certain time to get those little moments and be there when it was quiet so they didn't suspect I was just after that. Although the girl that let me in was a big fan of documentaries and she was kind of into it, but I think she left soon after. Um, but anyway, I mean, you know, the raw material was, was there, but then, and I did film uh, a guy talking about hunting. You see him yeah. in the film. He's actually Nigel Farage's brother. Um, <laughs> So the so when the so when the editor's watching watching this material, he's thinking, okay, how it's there, it's sort of there, this metaphor's there, but then how can we really bring it out? You know, so that's how it happens. Yeah. Um, sometimes you know I might have those ideas. Sometimes it's it's David who's who's doing that when I'm not there. You know, so it's uh, it's very much a collaboration. That way. Shall we open to mm -hmm. questions? Again, yeah? I think. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 really quite simple that you know once I've identified, let's say, with the road that okay, I'm interested in this road, which is a very long one, so that was quite complicated. But um, usually, I'm given a little bit of money by the BBC. I must say, it's getting more and more difficult to get anything done. But with that film, I was I probably had five thousand pounds development money, maybe a bit less. So there's a little bit of space and time to sort of develop the idea. Um, and also then to have somebody with me. And I remember with the road, for example, we, we drove the whole journey. We drove the whole of the A5. Um, I just wanted to get a sense of the whole road. Um, but, you know, somehow inevitably I got stuck in London. <laughs> um, and it's, you know, the research process is, is both sort of meeting people and then conceptualising as I go along what, it's, what this is really about and what, you know, because... It's quite, I mean, that's very, it's very broad to say, okay, I'm going to make a film on the road. But I was interested from, an, I met Iqbal, have you seen the film? Yeah. I met Iqbal, who's also, I, I, I was reading a book written by Iqbal at the time I was doing research. Um, this doesn't happen very often, I mean, that I read something and then get to meet the writer. And I was thinking that this might be a film that I would narrate, because it seemed to me somehow um, that there were things to say about this road that, you know, partly informational, but also, you know, that, that, that things to be said that I wouldn't find characters that would be able to articulate that. Anyway, I met Ekbal to talk to him about um, his book, because it was on very similar themes, and uh, then dis and there was a, a quote in his, at the beginning of his book, about this sort of notion of being um, in, in the non-space, you know, you leave your home and you, you can never return, but then you arrive somewhere but you're never really there. And that, that idea really kind of stuck with me and it informed a, a lot of the film and who I was looking for and to really kind of try and, you know, explore that idea. Um, and when I met him, he ended up having, he became a part of the film because he, I discovered he had his own story going on um, that was very much, you know, about that. Um, so it's both, you know, a very practical thing of looking for people, often on foot, you know, knocking on doors, approaching strangers, uh, trying to seduce, charm people, whatever it is, you know, open doors that you wouldn't normally open, going to places you wouldn't normally go to, and and sometimes emailing, you know, with the, obviously with the, the higher level kind of bankers, etc. You, you know, you, it's awkward to talk to them on the street. Um, although the re I remember the researcher kind of made a little card, and sometimes you just run up to people, you know, men in suits, and say, I know you haven't got time now, but just read this and give us a call if you, if you can. And, you leave them with a little card. Um, but the guy who actually ended up being in the film, one of them he found on the street, and the other one was through the process of emailing people, and he was somebody that got back to us. So it depends on the film, but often, you know, often it is a lot of legwork. And you need time for that, that's the thing, you need a lot of time. And you're not always given it, or, you know, the money doesn't always allow for it. But. Yes. So you have a before you shoot, you have a very, very clear idea of what you want the film to be about, and then it kind of becomes like a weird, loose state that you, you know, 
exactly what you want, or you kind of? I have ideas of the themes that I'm interested in, and but it never really springs into life or comes to life until I meet people, because then it sort of crystallizes. Just a vague idea. Very vague. I mean, the people kind of shape. What if I go back to the beginning of the the genesis of the road, for example. Um, I thought it would be interesting to make a film in London during the year of the Olympics. That was my starting point. I thought, could I make a little portrait of a character from every country that's participating in the Olympics living in London? But then I realised there are over a hundred and something. You know, it's like it would be a very long film. <laughs> <laughs> that, but that was the starting point. You know, how could I make a sort of, you know, it was back to your, your I mean, which is really interesting about the, the Persian rug. I was thinking about a mosaic. You know, I was thinking about a kind of very, you know, if you were able to sort of fly above and look down on London and see it as a, a, a rug, you know, what, what would it look like? And, and then at the time I'd recently moved to Kilburn area, so I was living uh, in a new place, and I suddenly started to think, well, you know, because I thought about, hey, I could go to, you know, go to Southall and film the Asians, go to Brixton and film the Western, you know, I could sort of get into the different sort of segregated bits of London, but that doesn't really exist anymore anyway, it's sort of mm -hmm. so mixed up. So I just started looking on the road around me, then discovered it was actually the A5 and it had some kind of uh, history to it. You know, it was this old Roman road. I didn't know that before. Um, so it's, it slowly kind of started to build from that. And the theme of you know, people from outside settling on that road was always, was always there because of the, the idea of making a film about the world coming to London for the Olympics but the world already being in London. Um, so I, had to, I, I do remember writing a treatment, it was called The World in London. Um, so I have these ideas, but it's, you know, it's very much a process. And it's constantly changing, so I never know what the film's going to be. So it's just really at the editing stage of making it? The film, as you see it, is something that happens in the editing. But, it, you know, not just because as soon as, I've, as soon as I start to film with somebody, and then I find somebody else, and there's three or four or five characters, and, you know, and I'm them thinking about what this bigger picture is going to look like. It never quite looks like the film that's actually made. But of course, you know, the, the editor can only really work with the material that I'm providing. So how much of it goes in the garbage? Is it a lot? Or is it uh, I, don't, I, sh I shoot less and less. I mean, uh, for Calais, it probably shot quite a lot, so maybe 60, 70 hours of material for an hour long film. For The Road, I think I shot 30 hours and it's a 75 minute film. It gets less and less because I'm I'm, I'm much stricter about when I press record these days, even though it's much cheaper to press record yeah. and to film endlessly. Because I suppose I'm just, you know, because I, you know, it's been quite a long time I've been doing it. I'm just more, um, you know, more sort of, you know, less open to sort of hoovering everything up and just seeing what's interesting. I, I think a bit more before I actually shoot. Because I'm again, it's about wanting to get something that that feels interesting to me and unique and different. And, but you know, having said that, I don't want to. I, I try not to sort of restrict myself or constrain myself too much, because then you might miss something interesting or cut yourself off. So you're kind of on the prowl. Absolutely, yeah. You know, yeah, I'm like the guys. Like, scary. like the guys. Like, like the guys. You know, <laughs> on the trading floor. <laughs> Wasn't it Ziga Vertov said that you know talked about hunting and filmmaking you know, and this was in the beginning of the last century. We are in a way. And how do you not get punched too much? I know, but I treat people nice. You know, I'm not like, I don't shoot them when I find them. I you know, nurture them. Like the guy who was crying on camera. The guy, uh, the the Afghan yeah. guy. Because I mean, he's you know. I, how, I mean, how are you allowing him? Because when I met him, he was, you know, the first, if you watch the first scene in the film, he's a refugee in this situation. He had an egg in his hand. He's peeling an egg that he's just been given. And he's pleading to the camera about the fact that they should let him into the country because he'll be an asset to, to British society. Um, so, because he thinks I'm a news crew or something, turned up there for one day to do a news piece and go back home. But, the, you know, the reality is I then, I then hang around and he sees me the next day and the next day. So even though we were only shooting for three weeks, I probably saw, well, I did see him every day. So you become... They trust you. Basically. Yeah, absolutely. You, have a, you build up a sort of relationship. Of some, it's a very, you know, it's what we were talking about earlier. It's a sort of film relationship, but it is a relationship. Um, and I think that, you know, if you're, 
if you give people time and you're talking to them about things that, that are clearly important to them, then it's, you know, I mean, there are, you know, for, for every person that I film, there are 50 that don't want anything to do with being filmed or run a mile, you know, so it's not, I mean, you're seeing the people that agree. And sometimes I start filming with people and I can't get beyond a sort of surface. Sure. Kind of surface or, you know, I remember in the road film, I filmed with a guy from Sudan who I loved as a character because he, he was running this estate agent on the road and he would fall asleep five, six times a day, just drift off into Sudan, the television was going on. It was wonderful, but I couldn't get anywhere with him because culturally he, he just wouldn't, you know, he, his story was interesting. He was looking, he was 60 and unmarried. He was, he really was desperate for, to have a woman in his life. And, um, but it, I was never, I could never film that stuff. It just wasn't sort of culturally possible. <coughs> so I had to let go of him. Uh, how do you deal with the sort of non-structural narrative in the film? In, like, for example, in the left. Hire a good editor. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's like, how do, you, how, do you, how do you make sure that you kind of sustain an audience for, let's say, in the, in the left, like half an hour? Yeah. But also in, I don't know, wife embarking. Because I know that you need, you know, I know that you have to have some, you've got to go somewhere and... <coughs> you know, if the first scene is a, as a guy, you know, a refugee guy peeling an egg, I know by the end of the film, we have to have gone somewhere with him. You know, big things don't need to happen. I mean, actually, all the scenes with Ijaz, nothing really happens. I mean, they're very, you know, one time I turn up and he talk, he's talking about the night before where he got arrested, another time like this. I mean, you know, nothing's happening, but everything's happening. You know, it's, I never film him jumping on the back of a truck. I didn't want, any, you know, I wasn't interested in filming action. Um, so but which I'm, stage has the sort of plot coming? In, in your sort of as I'm filming, I'm always thinking, what was the last thing I, s I filmed? What can be, mm. what would be the next scene that would move things forward? Mm. And then naturally you have, in the rushes, some progression. Mm. The broader structure of how these people then talk to each other and how, how you construct a narrative and how, you know, over time and how you use time in the film is something a little bit different, but something I'm always thinking about when I'm shooting.